Hello, and thank you for joining me after the lunch break to a talk called The Hacker's Guide to Perception. So, I've been introduced already. My name is Stefan Hager. I work for a company called Dativ in Germany. If you're not from Germany, it's completely normal that you have never heard about that company. We're doing software for tax consultants mainly, and there's a saying that 80% of the literature on taxes is in German. So we're a big company with a turnover of nearly a billion euro and um, 7,000 employees. I'm part of the internet security team, and we are looking at the security of our company from the outside, and that's where some of those ideas come from. This is not a hugely technical talk. It's not a talk about zero days, exploits, patching, whatever. It's a talk that more or less um, tries to, to uh, get you in, in touch with your perception, how you perceive things, and what might be good or wrong about that. This also means, since it's not technical, that some of the information in this talk might seem relevant to you, and some might not. So please just take away what you can. And if you want, um, the slides are going to be online afterwards. Please share freely. In case you want or need to leave early, the things I'm talking about are that I think you are shaping a big part of your reality and thus can change it if you don't like it. And that if you leave your brain running on autopilot, that it will severely limit your choices and that a little bit of creativity in whatever you're doing uh, is always an asset. And let's try whether we get there. But one of the questions that I want to answer at the beginning is, why do I feel the need for this talk? Because talking about the brain, about perception, about you handle things, about all that stuff is usually not the content of a technical conference. So how does it apply to hackers? Um, I hope it does. And I think personally that what we see in our industry with egos, um, infosec rock stars, superstars, egomaniacs, behavioral patterns, and not just with the infosec, people, but with uh, the regular users, um, behavioral changes are actually something that I would love to see. So I think it's a topic that concerns us in info security because we very often forget, forget the human element. And sometimes that human element um, seems to be ourselves. So part one, your brain is lying to you. And if I say your brain is lying to you, I might be exaggerating a little. Your brain is not lying to you all the time, but your brain is never giving you the full picture. And I'm not just saying that um, and leave you with that statement. I'm going to try to illustrate what I mean. Our brains and nervous systems have a bandwidth problem. If you moved recently or in the last 10 years, and needed a new internet provider, you probably all know these advertisements saying, um, this internet line will give you up to X Mbit per second power, uh, bandwidth, whatever. And a few years ago, it was a running joke that you would never reach that number. And I think with our brains, it's quite the same. Let's have a look at the senses and the input that our senses get, uh, our brain gets from our senses. This, the eyes usually deliver the most input to our brain with about 10 million bits per second, down to the tongue and taste with about 1,000 bits per second. And if you add that all up, then you get a number that says something like 10.7 Mbit per second. Really depends whether I am able to uh, do my maths correctly. But with all the numbers, I'm talking about right here, um, they are orders of magnitude. It doesn't matter whether it's exactly 10.7 or 11 or 20 or maybe even 50, because as you will see, a study from the MIT said that um, the brain doesn't process data faster than about 60 bits per second. If you compare 60 bits per second to 10.7 uh, Mbit per second, it really doesn't matter, it's orders of magnitude. The question is, what are we going to do with that information? It is something like up to, indeed. So 
what we can take away from that is that our senses deliver a lot more information than our brain, our conscious brain, can actually handle. And the interesting thing for me as somebody interested in hacking and everything is, what faculty in my body actually chooses what kind of information gets forwarded? Because there are other st studies saying that about 3% of the information that, is, that you get bombarded with every moment um, is being forwarded. And again, it's not really a matter of um, the correct number. It's just a real fraction of what, it's go what is going on. That leaves me to a few models that I think might be useful in looking at this problem. Our brains can be seen as having two distinct halves. Everybody knows that. But I'm not talking about the left and right hemisphere. I'm talking about a model by uh, Dr. Orr, and this model has been expanded by somebody called Robert Anton Wilson, whom you might or might not know as the author of Illuminatus and other interesting books. And they said the brain basically has a thinker and a prover. So the thinker can think about anything. The thinker can think he's standing on a planet that is flat or spherical or inside a spherical planet. The thinker can think that the planet revolves around the sun or that the sun revolves around the planet. The thinker basically can think itself healthy or even sick. And the prover's job is so much easier. The prover's job is just to prove that the thinker is right. The prover proves what the thinker thinks. That is the basic thing in that. Which means, if we have biases, then these biases get reaffirmed on a daily basis. Let's not call it biases. We have a certain kind of worldview. And usually most humans are comfortable if that worldview is affirmed again and again. For example, um, I can walk through Munich without getting a knife in my back. It's a very comforting thought. And each time I walk through Munich and don't get a knife in my back, this is reaffirmed. I like being reaffirmed in my thoughts. Most people are. The other thing is, um, I could talk, I could probably fill all the 45 minutes with talking about biases, and it's not just the confirmation bias um, that you probably have heard about. It's really about everything we think about could be biased. It's not a bad thing, it's just something we should bear in mind when making decisions and things like that. And since not all information is getting forwarded to our brain, something is withheld. So let's consider this street scene somewhere in Asia. I'm a completely um, ignorant Westerner, so I can't really read the signs and everything. But let's assume I have to go to the toilet. And it doesn't matter whether it's in an Asian city or somewhere else. It's just if I need to go to the toilet somewhere, my brain will automatically pick up signs and try to give me a good direction. Maybe pick out a hotel sign. In that case, maybe pick out the sign saying tourist information. Now, if I was hungry, for example, my brain probably would ignore the tourist information because um, they don't sell food. But maybe my smell or my eyes would be um, distracted by the, by the food carts and by the people um, close, to the, um, close to the vegetables and the fruit. So I probably would go there. It really depends on what I'm focusing on, which kind of information is being forwarded. There's one thing that always takes precedence uh, in our lives, and that is if something is being perceived as being dangerous. I apologize to that guy with the mobile phone. I don't think he's dangerous. I just picked him out at random. If we perceive something as dangerous, everything else goes to, um, to the background, starts a background process, and I am completely aware and try to deal with a dangerous situation, whatever it might be. And then, of course, there's the thing that we are able to glitch reality. We... You probably all know about optical illusions. Some of them are a little bit funny. Some of them have a little bit more impact. If you have seen this, I apologize because uh, you will know the effect. But just 
judging from that picture, who of you thinks that A and B are a different color? Just from what you see. All right. So, um, the squares to the left of the slide are the same color as A. I hope we can agree on that. And I probably shouldn't say that in a Microsoft building, but I used PowerPoint to demonstrate that because it's horrendously difficult to get PowerPoint to cheat on that or to work with it. So, if we just move them here, you will see the following. Just to do it once again, uh, because the effect is interesting even when it moves there. The thing about optical illusions is some of them are funny. But what you should know is that your brain does calculations for you. Your brain knows there's a green cylinder. That cylinder is throwing a shadow. Whatever moves into the shadow, thus, has to have a lighter color than what appears in the shadow. So your brain is filling out that gaps for you. So if you never question that, or if you never question that input that your brain gives you, then um, of course A and B are of a different color, but really they are not. To illustrate this further, and don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with just optical illusions all the talk, although that might be funny for me, but I won't. I never am sure how that comes out on projectors, but this should be a uniform gray bar. It is in my presentation. If I change the background, you will see that the left end of the bar seems to be a much lighter color than the right, hand, right end. Still the same bar. So, especially when it comes to colors and things like that, our brain does a lot, of, lot for us. It's not restricted to optical illusions, though. There are auditory illusions as well. I picked out one at random, which is um, binaural beats. I don't know whether you're aware of them. It's a kind of sine wave for each ear. And if you listen to them with headphones, the sine waves will create an interference pattern, which taps out a rhythm or something like that. It's an interesting effect. It's very often used in meditation and things like that. And it is completely lost as soon as you play the music via loudspeakers, because it really just needs your brain to create that interference pattern between the ears. More illusions, olfactory illusions, which means smell that basically isn't there. So the thing with demonstrating something like that, smell, um, that is very difficult because basically you need a chemical laboratory set up uh, and, and try to prove that there's a smell um, or that the smell is not there. I only have one example for an olfactory illusion from personal experience, I was driving the Gibb River Road in Australia, and this is in the outback. There's nobody for miles and miles and miles. And I was refilling the gas tank of the car. And all of a sudden, the diesel, the petrol, smelled like the most delicious onions and bacon. Funny thing, I, I was sniffing my fingers. Yes, um, it's now on video. I'm sniffing my fingers. Um, <laughs> But they smelled of onions and bacon, not of petrol. And I was fascinated because I knew I was the only person around for miles. So those happen. If you're suffering from tactile illusions, then I really don't envy you. Each of us probably knows the feeling that we sat somewhere in the summer in a nice shady place and all of a sudden we feel an insect crawling on our skin touching this hair and the other, and just moving. And when we looked, nothing was there. People who are actually suffering from tactile illusions don't have that feeling with one insect, but with thousands or ten thousands. So these illusions exist as well. So not only do our nerves not deliver all the info to our conscious brain, because they can't, they are also wrong every now and then. The last example here are gustatory illusions. Um, has anybody of you ever had a miracle fruit or wonderberry? If you haven't, um, this is still a very street legal thing to do. It is uh, called miracle fruit, I think, and uh, you can find you can find that online. <laughs> Everything. 
And the interesting thing is it goes to the sour receptors of your tongue and numbs them. So usually if you eat a lemon, your tongue and all your senses will deliver to your brain, this is sour, because this is the overpowering thing that the lemon does, the overpowering taste. Now, if you block out the receptors on your tongue that say this is sour, you will find new tastes in stuff that you have been eating for years, like pineapples, strawberries. Everything that has a sour touch to it will taste completely different because you actually taste the aspect of the fruit that you have never tasted be before because your brain was just saying sour, sour, sour. All in all, it leads me to the conclusion to say that brains are slightly random filters with dynamic rules, aka firewalls, something like that, when it comes to the information that is going to your consciousness, which I think is quite cool. The problem is you don't have an audit trail. So usually at no point when you are not really aware of what's happening, can you say what kind of filters or what kind of sensors delivered the stuff to your brain, and why you don't have an audit trail. And there's only one relatively simple solution to that, and that is um, you have to use yourself to observe yourself in order to change yourself all the time, and some recursion involved, of course, because usually when we watch ourselves very closely and we humans are thankfully that meta that we can observe ourselves, very often we react differently. But that is the whole point, because we are not running on automatic anymore. And as soon as I observe what I'm doing, and I'm running into some pattern or knee-jerk reaction that I wanted to do anyway, as soon as I observe myself, I can hopefully at some point choose to react differently. So, now comes a part that you probably won't appreciate, Chen, I'm sorry for that because we have defense mechanisms in our brain as well. And in order to overcome them, we have to keep a very open mind. And with that, I'd like to ask you to keep a very open mind and imagine a guy riding a hard steel cock. And after that, I would like that you think about a very open-minded Darth Vader. So, and while your brain was probably preparing you for an extreme graphic image in the first example, or something at least somehow sexual, and try to prepare you for that, your brain might not have been prepared for the Darth Vader from a much sexier universe. And even innocent things like um, SpongeBob could be abused, and we all know where this probably is headed and what's going on there. And I enjoy InfoSec conferences because it allows me to bring stuff like Pussy Magazines and show it around. This is Pussy Magazine, a magazine for cats by cats. And the thing is, our brains love to be surprised in a good way. We don't like bad surprises, but our consciousness deals with the same kind of situations every now and then. And whenever something happens that doesn't fit the preconception, it might be funny, it might be scary as well, but our brain likes to be entertained as well. So, and apart from pussy, there's also bitch magazines for the dog, lo dog lovers. Um, so, and whoever wants to have a look at my pussy magazine afterwards is welcome to. So basically, there are some similarities to all the defense mechanisms that we employ in info security and that we have in our brain. As every comparison, it might be a little bit crude, but I think it helps to illustrate that our brains are doing a lot more than we usually give them credit for. In info security, we have anti-DDoS stuff. So whenever somebody is trying to get one of our servers down and bombards it with lots and lots and lots of traffic, the anti-DDoS thing jumps, uh, comes, comes into play and filters out the bad traffic and just leaves the good traffic. Our mind has lots and lots and lots of ideas all the time. And probably, thankfully, only a handful is let through, and the rest is just discarded. 
you can try that out for yourself if you um, catch yourself being in a very creative phase and having idea after idea. Just wait 10 minutes and try which ones you remember and which ones you don't. So always write down your good ideas. We have mechanisms like IDS, IPS, and to some extent, antivirus in info security. Mechanisms that look for known patterns and know that these patterns are either good or bad, and then we either drop them or forward them, which basically is what um, an IPS would do. IDS just reports on them. Within our mind, we have something similar, and that is um, behavioral patterns scripted reactions. If you think about it, there might be something in your life, um, some situation that you try to avoid, but if you run into the situation, you tend to react the same every time and be angry about it afterwards. If there's something like that in your life, then you've just found a behavioral pattern and can work on that. Congrats. Another big thing in info security at the moment, or at least the last year, was user behavioral analysis, where basically a machine, I'm not going to uh, say an AI, but a machine learning algorithm is trying to classify users and user behavior, cluster that, and try to compare it to regular behavior. So, for example, if you have a group of accountants, they might come into the office between 8 and 10. They might work until 6 or 8 and probably access one or two servers and have Excel or other programs they heavily work with. If you compare this group of people to somebody from, from the sysadmins, then this, it's completely different because the sysadmins will log on any time of the day. They will work from home. They will log on to a lot of machines. They will probably not use Excel if they can help it, but will SSH a lot and things like that. And the UBAs try to um, get that information. And for example, if Tom, the accountant, exhibits a behavior like a sysadmin, then this will raise an alarm. This is something that is relatively difficult to implement, um, in, at least I think it is, because the definition of normal is something that is quite difficult to do if the network is complex enough. The good thing we as humans have is we have evolved to detect anomalies. So that's really easy for us. So we get that point. Another thing we like to do is if we found some kind of threat or malware or anything that we s think is malicious, we put it in a sandbox. We let it run. We have a look at it, we see what it does, which kind of registry keys it wants to access, which kind of values it wants to change, what it wants to do generally. So sandboxing is a thing. I'm deliberately, again, not going into sandboxing evasion methods because they are there, but for the sake of this example, this is sandboxing. And we do much of the same. Whenever we have a big decision to make, be it, say, buying a house, or talking to a girl we like, or really doing anything that is a little bit more than eating the next um, chocolate bar. We like to daydream. We have that situation in our heads. We play it out. We play it out in many, many myriads of ways just to get a feeling for it, whether this is something we would really like or not. So basically, humans are doing sandboxing as well. And one last example. Um, that I already briefly touched upon. Within modern enterprise networks, we have firewalls everywhere. At least most of the companies have that. We segmented networks, we have firewalls, and every time a packet goes through a network, it will pass at least one firewall. And the thing is, with the thinker and the prover, if our mind doesn't think that this special thought, this special information, is worthwhile, it's going to be dropped by the internal firewall. So these are a lot of comparisons between info security methods and between the human mind. What I want to illustrate next is that although they serve as an example and they serve for us to actually see what our brain does with our thoughts and everything, analog versus digital is still a thing that you can't really compare. 
if you get an email or let's say a text just saying I'm happy to see you, all those 23 bytes or something like that, um, don't know, then in a digital format this will be all the information you get. In an interpersonal communication, there's the nonverbal communication, but I'm not talking about that. There's pronunciation, for example. So if I say, I am happy to see you, then that probably means I'm happy to see you, but he's not. Or if I say, I'm happy to see you, then I'm happy to see you, but not your mother-in-law, and stuff like that. So in analog communications, there's a much more going on than in digital ones. And now you remember the 60 bit of consciousness that each of us seems to have? Let's try and put it to the test. I give you guys and myself much more credit and say, let's say we have 48 bytes of consciousness, okay? Instead of 60, 48 bytes seems good. So, there is this movie that I hopefully can start somehow. Does it start? No, yes. Yeah, please see what you can take. Which kind of what what information you can take from that movie? And again, I said 48 bytes because I thought you know if you take one of the squares as a really really big pixel, it would be 48 bytes. Any takers? How many colors were there in total? Any takers? Were all the slides unique? So just to have a look at it again, um, it's going to illustrate a point because I don't think, or I think that a lot of people here in the room could write a small program to analyze that video and tell me the exact answers because it's easy to analyze. But it's easy to analyze for a computer. So just for the curious among you, um, tiles 2 and 7 were identical, and tile uh, uh, slide 15 was slide 13, just rotated on by 90 degrees. Doesn't really matter, because our brains are not really optimized for that kind of information. Have a look at that movie then, which contains a lot more than 48 bytes. It's the exact same length as the previous one. But after watching that, I'm pretty sure most of you could answer a lot of these questions. If you, if you have a look at these questions, these are much more specialized than in the video before. So the whole point I'm trying to make is that brains are definitely not general purpose, as computers are. We are highly specialized. Sometimes you need a demonstration for that. There is a quote by the great Tor Neurotrandus who said that precisely because we can be aware of um, our shoes that are too small at one point and the expanding universe in the next moment, because of that, our brains are seen as having this limitless capacity. But they don't. Because if you try to remember something at any given moment, or see what you're conscious about at that given moment, it's very often not much. But let's continue. So how does it benefit your work? How does it benefit your cyber? Why should you bother to think about your own defensive mechanisms and your own perception? So the first thing is, if you're recruiting for cyber, then very often if you look at the AdWords in be it Monster, Xing, or whatever, it seems that recruiters have that very fixed picture of an IT guy in mind and try to recruit absolutely for that. And the difference between blue and red team seems to be a beard, and it's exaggerated, of course. But what I'm saying is um, the next example for that is a good and a very bad example in two ways, but I'm getting to that. If you're recruiting for cyber and maybe you have the picture in mind and it's not a bad picture, of a person who does a really good job. If you're just recruiting and try to clone that person, you might end up with a Fellowship of the Ring looking like Nick Cage. There was another um, Nick Cage talk in the Rookie track, I'm very happy. Um, the thing is, Nick Cage might be a good actor, but probably the success of the 
movies would have been slightly less if he had been the only actor. In The Fellowship of the Ring, and I completely agree that this is a fictional novel, um, the success of the team was based on the different things everybody brought to the, uh, to the whole. If they all had the same skill, they wouldn't have succeeded. So we need variety and we need creative people. We need a lot more variety in when we are recruiting for cyber and in the industry as a whole, I think. And I said it's also a very bad example because, yes, the Fellowship of the Rings, they are all male, aren't they? So there's no woman there, and I apologize. Um, it was the only Nick Cage-related picture I could find that would illustrate my point. If you are in social engineering, if you're working with that, if you're working as a social engineer, I don't really have to tell you that if you understand how your brain works and how you can influence your own brain, that this, of course, is a skill that can easily be transferred to your work because other people's brains work the same. One other thing is that as soon as you start trying to see why the information you get at any given moment is exactly the information you get at that moment, is you start to understand yourself better. I had that example of knee-jerk reactions where you just stumble into a situation and you react on autopilot. You do something you usually don't like to do, like getting angry or making a sassy remark or something like that. Um, and as soon as you start observing yourself, you understand better what you're doing and you can actually change the way you react. It's not on autopilot anymore. And there's the whole thing about doing things actually differently. This is something, doing things differently, it doesn't always lead to success. So just because you are using IP addresses that are not RFC 1918 in your network, um, I've seen something like that, a customer who just had, for example, building two, um, third floor, first office, first computer would be 2.3.1.1. This is doing things differently, but this is not necessarily better. But if you, for example, think back to the time where you counted on fingers, whether it has been 40 years or three days, it doesn't matter. Um, usually we count to 10 on our fingers, but we are all um, confident with binary. So if you actually take every digit as a um, two to the power of something, you can actually count to 1023 on your fingers still looks silly, is doing things differently, but it's also thinking about things differently. It's some kind of tool that you already have and that you can already use. And if you don't like that example, I've got a real-world example for you. Um, I'm not a war buff, I really don't like wars. But in the Second World War, there was the Ghost Army. That was a division of the United States, the 30, 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, and yes, 23rd, for those of us counting numbers. And these guys in the picture are not exceptionally strong super soldiers. They just have an inflatable tank. Because the Ghost Army recruited heavily from people who were creative, painters, uh, artists, whatever, just not military guys. And the job of the 23rd was to confuse the Germans, basically. And they succeeded very well. The thing is, all the job was deception. They would move into somewhere at night. They had sound installations where the sound was played from a division moving in, like 20, 30,000 people moving in, tanks moving in, lorries moving in. And they had all the sounds recorded back at their home base where it was safe and just replayed during night somewhere close to the border not close enough for the Germans to just send somebody and look what happened. And they would also have those inflatable tanks and a few real tanks because when the Germans then went via air to see what happened there, they would see a massive amount of tanks. But if there hadn't been any tank tracks, that would have been suspicious. So they had a few real tanks to lay the tracks and they had that inflatable things and sound installations. And with that kind of deception, they managed to close a gap that had opened 
from Germany to Paris after Paris had been retaken, and about 2,000 people in the Ghost Army simulated 70,000 people. And so the Germans didn't push through. So deception and doing things differently and thinking about stuff does have a few real-world um, implications. The next slide, um, of course, why should you think a lot? Um, you're losing weight. It doesn't happen for me, uh, or maybe I don't think a lot, but your brain takes about 20% of your calories and burns those. So whenever you're thinking you're doing your body a favor, um, this, of course, is with a, uh, with a smile. All right, so if I have managed to get you into the whole thing of thinking about yourself and perception, you might ask for tools. There are a few tools, and you need to work out what works for you. The one thing that always works, or that is the beginning, beginning of everything, is to be more conscious of how you react, what you do, how you deal with certain situations. And if you observe yourself, I'd like to ask you to not judge yourself at that moment, because that happens later anyway. But just see in that situations that you don't like, see what happens, and then try to figure out why it happens in the aftermath. And one thing that really works for me is if you have some strong concepts about anything, then just go on a holiday and pick a country where you have no cultural reference point at all. So for me, that would probably be something in either maybe Africa, Asia, somewhere, and see what, what is important to the people there. And see that the stuff that is important to you, for example, that your fingernail color matches your clothes, is something that is of total non-importance to them. And find out what actually, um, how you can overcome your own um, preconceptions of what culture is or, or, or what you are, or what, what you have to be, just by diving into a, a different kind of culture and seeing that most of it is nonsense. And then there's the thing, whenever you do something like that, whenever you try to get to the bottom of your reactions, your perceptions, yourself, there will come the point where you offend yourself, probably. Really depends on your character, but if you have strong beliefs in something and you start to question them, then um, it's going to be uncom uncomfortable for, for you, probably. So as long as it's yourself and you're dealing with, please don't be afraid to offend yourself because what are you going to do? Sue yourself? But on the other hand, if somebody holds the same belief, then just try to offend, not to offend them because they have their own issues and everything. Just be kind to yourself and others, I guess. And before I come to the end, a few pitfalls and conclusions that go along with that. This is a definition of being scientific, that whenever you're doing an experiment, there might be some results and facts which are counterintuitive, but if you repeat the experiment often enough and the result is always the same, then the result must be true, even if it's counterintuitive. Can you agree to that definition? Hopefully. Now, if you're going into the whole mind hacker mindset, mind hacker mindset, then it gets a little bit more vague. Like my personal perception leads me to a different assumption, therefore that aspect of the model seems wrong to me. See, there's nothing hard in there because I can't say I believe the Earth is cubic because I believe it. I mean, I can say that, but it doesn't make it true. But with any kind of observation you make about yourself, I think this is completely true. Because the kind of experience you have with your perception of, or as a human being is different from everybody else. And you might have some points where you connect, but the thing is, it's still your individual reality. And stuff like that, flat earthers, and I, I hope I don't offend any of you if you're flat earthers, but I really, really don't think anybody is here and a flat earther. Um, it's a thin line. 
And to be completely honest, the one thing I think most hackers can, can stand behind is that we're doing that for freedom because most of us really like freedom. I don't like the thought that there are automated reactions and behavioral patterns that were imprinted on me or that I imprinted upon myself when I was younger and everything reacting to situations. I actually like to analyze them and be free in my decisions because it gives me freedom of choice. And this, this is probably the main reason why I'm doing that. And as always, I try to stay on the scientific side, on that, on the side that I can be proven, and so on and so forth. But from hypnosis to homeopathy or any other things, there are so many other things our brain does or can do when it's convinced that this is the thing to do, that the rabbit hole I'm talking about goes a lot deeper than that. I'm always too happy to discuss those things. So if you're interested, um, hit me up on Twitter or email or whatever, or in the coffee break, because I love talking about that stuff. I also like to thank all those nice websites that gave me stock pictures, because that way I could stay more or less legal when doing a presentation. And actually, that's it for me. For me, are there any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions for Stefan? So that means you're all going to go home and reflect upon how you perceived his presentation today. Now, I guess it means that I didn't do a good job in waking them up after lunch. Sorry, guys. Mm. <laughs> See, he's already observing what has just occurred and he's judging. Now, what did we learn from this presentation today? Um, there's a quote I would like to say from J.R. Bob Dobbs, which says, I don't act as I preach because I'm not the person I'm preaching to. Ah. <laughs> no, that's, that's a joke, of course. Do as I say and not as I do. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. No, um, I would be happy if you think about that and if you found it a worthwhile talk here at Besides Munich. Thank you again for having me. And again, if you have questions, I'm, I'm there all day. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you.